Hi, everyone. I'd like to officially welcome you to The Art of Visual Inquiry, Increasing Understanding with Connections. My name is Shelley Hayduck, and I'm co-hosting today's event with Matt Caton, our Director of Customer Solutions. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. And we also have Patrick Thompson uh, joining us who will be monitoring our Q&A throughout the session. So for those of you who just logged in and missed the preamble, uh, I did want to mention we have a very active Q&A going throughout the session. Uh, due to the volume of attendees, you will be muted. Um, so feel free to chat with a colleague about anything you're seeing on the screen. That being said, we absolutely want your feedback and your, your questions. And that's going to happen through our Q&A panel. And we're going to reserve a good 15 minutes to go through those questions as well as any new questions that uh, might arise. Today's session is all about um, building that context for knowledge in a visual manner, um, specifically when it comes to research and developing a knowledge base. And what we find with a lot of our customers is um, learning and insight actually has its challenge. Uh, challenges. First of all, you have information overload. You're dealing with massive amounts of information that actually impede knowledge acquisition. And of course, you've got multiple channels, whether you are a researcher at a drug company or you're a um, cardiac uh, surgeon studying to uh, be a doctor. Um, you know, you have lesson plans, events, deadlines. So bringing all this disparate information together is sort of a key aspect, but bringing it together in a way that enables you to get that greater context. So uh, in essence, uh, it's not always easy to learn unless you have that sort of big place for your thinking in that big picture. So with the brain, uh, what we're going to show you to do today is how you can see and understand key relationships. You can organize your files, your web research, your uh, any type of content you might have visually and track classes, registration, deadlines, personal information for those of you who are students on the call today. And then of course, uh, uh, m most importantly, make connections and draw insights. So the idea behind visual inquiry is that we can pose a question in our brain and actually by mapping out the knowledge and bringing information together, make connections that would otherwise be um, invisible and not rel not or not uh, available. We wouldn't realize these things exist unless uh, plotted out in a brain. So. A um, couple things. We're going to use your brain to help you understand key ideas and themes. Um, you can use it for, as a study guide for better retention of knowledge and, of course, to access information. Um, you can also use it to refresh your me memory and, of course, to gain a new perspective on that information, relate those ideas, and to make those ideas explicit. A lot of times we have ideas in our head or we have a folder of documents, but by visualizing them in the brain interface, um, we get a new level of consciousness and um, insight on that information that you wouldn't get if it was just stored in a folder. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and close the PowerPoint and go into my brain here. The first example I want to show you is our teaching and learning brain. I'm going to go ahead and click on learning about. Now this particular brain, uh, we've mapped various subjects subjects from language arts to philosophy to science to social studies. And all I have to do is click on that thought. And what that's going to do is trigger all related pieces of information. Now as I click downward, like your file folder directory, there is some directionality to a brain. Um, we're drilling down deeper into an information set. So if I want to go into biology and life sciences, um, you know, I can go into genetics, living things, human body, and so on and so forth. So um, very similar um, to a file folder system in that way. And very easy to understand and sort of subcategorize information because we do enable that nonlinear connection of information. But at the same time, we certainly want you to be able to create the basic subcategories. And in fact, we're going to cover how to start a new brain. And part of starting it is creating that basic categorization structure and then cross-connecting and building those relationships with the links. So um, if I go ahead and click on human body, I'm moved into a particular area within biology and life sciences. And what you can see here is each thought 
has its own color. Um, these, this color represents a thought type. In fact, if I go ahead here and I go to my types tag, I can go ahead and look at all these different thought types that I have in this particular brain. Um, I have thought types for diseases. So if I click on that thought type, everything that is typed as such in this brain um, will appear. And then from there, I can jump into maybe it's heart disease that I'm interested in, or maybe it's uh, um, brain health itself. So um, there's lots of ways to navigate. So you have, in addition to your thought relationships and display, thought types. Um, you can also see here I've got my scrolling breadcrumb trail of everything I've clicked on. That's my past thought list. So if I any time kind of moved around and want to kind of know where I came from, I can just look at this list right here. So I can go back to the human body just by clicking on that as well. And then of course we have our search ability. So if I wanted to start typing in the first couple letters of something, so maybe I'm doing some research on diabetes, I can just type in DI and then boom, everything that ha has that uh, lettering appears. So I can then click on diabetes and everything uh, related to that topic comes very nicely. Now one of the nice things about the brain is not only the parent and child relationship, but you have uh, sibling thoughts, thoughts that share the same parent. So under diseases and human conditions, you can see that we have other types of diseases there as well. And I can go back to diabetes. And then we also have to the left what we call a jump thought. Now, jump thought is something that's related, not necessarily a um, child thought or a parent, but it's a connection. So for instance, very interestingly enough, um, Alzheimer's, they've, they've made a very, this researcher is actually exploring the connection between diabetes as a predisposing condition to Alzheimer's disease. So I can click on that and then move to that particular um, area. One of the nice things about the brain is the ability to have multiple uh, categories uh, for a particular piece of information. This is what we call multidimensional categorization. So here you can see that this particular Alzheimer's disease is under acetylcholine and that's a neurotransmitter and we have an image there of that. It's under a lesson plan. And it's also under brain health. So I could have got to this particular piece of information, this information cluster from any number of paths in this brain. And that's also important for visual inquiry and study, especially if you're sharing your knowledge. And we'll cover how to share these brains as well. Because with um, knowledge sharing, you want to give people many different perspectives and aspects of what they're looking at. And the only way to do that is to have a multidimensional categorization system. And that's not really possible with just a search box or a file folder directory. But with the brain, um, you can link things to as many other things as possible. And hence, that is where the, the knowledge and context comes in. So real, right here, I can see very quickly some very interesting things. And if I want to learn more about maybe neurotransmitters, uh, neurotransmitters, I can go ahead and, and click on this area. And that takes me up to, that's under brain chemistry and neuroscience. And so now I'm in a completely different area of the brain. Now, of course, in addition to representing ideas and content, um, you can connect things. So for instance, if I want to go ahead and uh, click on cognitive neuroscience, you can see that this particular thought has a link to a web page on the Wikipedia. So I'm going to go ahead and launch that page. And now you can see I've got all kinds of uh, access to information on the web and it's very easy to continue to build this. So if I want to build out my cognitive neuroscience section, what I can do is I can just come into this brain and for instance, uh, there's a whole area here on Wikipedia on neuroscience. Let me go ahead and drag and drop this link. So I'm just dragging from the browser address window and dropping on my thought and I've dr created that link now in my brain. The other thing that I can do that's kind of cool is if I like images um, as a researcher, I can copy any image from the web or my clipboard and I can go back to that particular thought and I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to go ahead and paste this as a thought icon. So now I have this really nice neuroscience image attached to this particular 
thought as well. And that can be very helpful for product development, by the way, if you want to get these zoomable images and then annotate. So um, for every researcher, in addition to web links, you're going to want to take notes on your research. So um, each thought has the, its own notes area. And so if I want to go in and take a note, or maybe I just want to grab this definition of what neuroscience is, I'm going to go ahead and copy that and just come over here and paste it into my notes section. And so you can see I've got this right here in my brain now. Um, all this kind of stuff very nicely, and that takes us to the, the nervous system as well. So that's coming together really nicely. If I want to go back to my cognitive neuroscience area and add a few more thoughts in there, I can do that. I can go ahead and start a whole um, research paper. So let me just go ahead and say research. And of course, we've got spell check here on cognition. OK, so I'm going to do some research on cognition. So in this case, I might want to go ahead and attach a Word document. So I've just right clicked on that thought. And I'm going to go ahead and add an attachment. In this case, I'm going to make it a Word document. So now I can actually go ahead and start my research paper. And it's launched right from the brain. So I'm going to start um, mission, And I'm going to save this. And this goes ahead and it gets saved right into the brain. Now if I ever want to come back and do a second version of this, I can open this again. Because um, I know especially writers, there's lots of versions. I can go to File and Save As. And when I've created an internal document, it is actually saved um, in the current brain folder. And each brain folder has its own unique ID. And I can still do versioning simply by changing the uh, the name of the file, like I do you know, if I were saving it anywhere else. And now I'm going to save a version 2 of this. So I've got version 2. I'm going to close this document. And what you can see here now is my research on cognition has two documents attached. Now, the other thing about that is I can do a search on the web. So in the options area, you have this web search, which is also F4, that will launch a web search on your active thoughts. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And now I'm going out to the web to actively go ahead and get more information to build this section of my brain. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead, and there's a great site here, a uh, great article from Science Direct. And I'm simply going to drag and drop this into my brain. And hopefully that's coming across. It's almost like painting with web links. And again, I'm going to do that one more time. So I'm going to click on this uh, research from John Hopkins University. And I'll just give the page a chance to load here. All in cognitive science. Very nice. And I'm simply going to drag and drop this in my research on cognition area in the brain. So I can continue to do this. Um, and I can also think of new things. I know there is an uh, someone by the name of Stephen. But, and it's going to show me anyone in my brain who uh, would exist by that name. And in this case, I want to go ahead and add Stephen Pinker, who is a cognitive scientist. And I'm going to go ahead and do a web search on this person as well. And here we go. We've got a picture. We can go ahead and copy this image. And then the other thing that's really nice is we can also go ahead and do a Twitter search. So in addition to web content, if we want to go ahead and get stuff off the brain, we can uh, out of the brain, we can do that. So if I want to go ahead and just type in, do a new Twitter search, or go back to options, and um, just type Stephen here right here, I can preview what I'm going to find here. And let me just close this so we can look. And here's all this information. And I can create a hashtag on Cognition in my brain, or I can add his Twitter feed. So in this case, if I want to do that, I'll just come over here and I'm going to drag and drop that Twitter link to his 
page as well. So now when I'm on this research and cognition, if I want to click on this link, this is actually going to launch this scientist's research page as well. So you can see here how quickly and easily it is. And if this is relating back to my research on cognition, um, maybe I want to put it more as a parent thought because he is actually kind of leading the field in this area. So he goes up here, or maybe Stephen belongs actually right up here as a jump. You know, we can decide where we want to put him just by changing those links very nicely. Um, now, the other thing I can do is if I go back to my options and I want to do a Twitter search, if I just want to do a Twitter a hashtag on, let's just say, cognition. And I'm not even going to preview it. I'm just going to create that thought. So now you can see that automatically takes me to any hashtags that people might have on that topic. Maybe we need to do something a little bit more general. Let's actually do a hashtag on psych. So we'll go back to that Twitter search. And uh, actually, let's go ahead and uh, let's do hashtag psych. Or maybe we'll do thinking. That's be good. I'm trying to think of one that will get us a lot of stuff here. I'm not even going to preview. I'm just going to create that thought. So now we go and we're going to go ahead and look at that. And here's all the stuff that's happening with that hashtag. So if you have particular hashtags on a topic that you want to actively follow in integrating your brain, you have papers, um, and if you have um, web pages, all that can come together very nicely. Now, integrating existing information is just as easy. So um, here I have some research actually on diabetic meal planning. So let me go ahead and activate that thought. And from here, I'm going to create a new area called meal planning. And now what I can do is I can simply drag and drop this Word document. And that, goes, that will make a shortcut to where it exists on my computer. And then from there, I have two options. I can move this file into the brain or copy it or just leave it as a shortcut. Um, I can also adjust my properties uh, and preferences so that these are automatically moved if I'm moving a lot of files. Now, I will say that if you want to synchronize your data to the cloud, you'll probably want to have these files stored internally. Um, the other thing that I can do is I can copy this for this uh, document and paste it into my brain. So um, existing information, you can drag and drop, um, copy and paste. You can create new documents simply by clicking on attachment and launching a new um, uh, file that you want to. And with that, you can kind of create a working space. I just want to build a little bit on what Shelley has established. Um, Shelley had some great examples of, again, using those thought types for a better understanding of your information, as well as bringing in content, bringing in those web links, bringing in those uh, other data sources, documents, et cetera. I'm going to expand on both of those features a little bit, but I'm going to do that by creating a new brain from scratch. So as you can see, I have, uh, this is actually one of my business brains that's open right now, but I am actually going to go ahead and start a new brain. So I'll just click on File, New. And it's important to point out that you can create as many different types of brains as you'd like. Uh, brains for your business, brains for your uh, personal activities, hobbies and interests, for your family, for your friends. Um, you can merge them together and even segment them into smaller topic-specific brains if you're just building a mega brain. Those choices are, are yours, but just know that they are available. Those are some more advanced features of the application that we probably won't get a chance to talk to, to, uh, uh, to address today, but just know that they are available. So I'm going to create a new brain, and this is going to be called, uh, we'll call it W. Shakespeare. So let's go ahead and create this new brain. Let me add the E there. And also notice that you can actually create a template 
Um, we've got many different templates available for you built right into the application. So if you're just getting started with a brain and you want to create a brain on, on education, uh, you can actually select the option for education. And what you're going to get is basically, uh, I like to call it a sort of a vanilla structure of a brain. It's just got topics, general topics for uh, classes, courses, curriculum, students, activities, etc. And you can actually go ahead and modify those topics to make it fit your own interest or delete them if you're not using them or even use that brain as sort of a sandbox just to get familiar with the technology. I'm going to start from scratch today. So just a new brain called William Shakespeare. I'll say OK. And Shelley mentioned this early on. It's important to create those key level uh, uh, topics, those must create topics, high level categories for all of your information to fit into. Obviously, everything that's going into this brain is going to be related in some way to William Shakespeare. Uh, but if I just connected everything to this one thought, uh, that structure wouldn't have a lot of use and wouldn't provide me with that extra context, that extra visualization that the brain can give you. So I'm going to click and drag off of a gate to create a new child thought for literature. And I'm going to share with you a nice little tip. If you're just getting started with the brain, you can create groups of individual thoughts very quickly with the semicolon. So literature, semicolon, movies, resources, and games. I like to create an area uh, for, in this case, for understanding William Shakespeare. For a real beginner, if I was educating people or if I had a class, particularly kids or young students, on William Shakespeare, but even with adults, there's a lot of Shakespearean games. So we can actually have some fun with this, and I can link to these different resources uh, to give people a variety of choices, because I'm going to be sharing this brain at the end of the demo with the entire world. I'm actually going to sync this to the cloud so other people can access my William Shakespeare brain. So I've separated these with a semicolon, and notice that created four individual thoughts for me really quickly. So let's get started down under literature. Obviously, there would be topics for uh, Shakespeare's comedies, tragedies, history, sonnets, etc. And I'll go ahead and start under the tragedy and just start it off with Hamlet. So this is where I'm going to be adding all of my information. And Shelley showed us once again that we can drag and drop from the web. So if I had some web resources on Hamlet, this is a great place to start dragging and bringing them into the brain. Or even documents, drag and drop to create those shortcuts or move files into the brain. In this scenario, what I'm going to do is first I'm going to create um, some areas for specific characters that I'm interested in. Uh, so obviously there's Hamlet himself, Ophelia, Claudius. And of course, I hit enter too quickly. Uh, a couple of my favorites, uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Rosencrantz, if I spelled that right, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. So now some of these characters are more important than others. And there's ways to make those stand out. Now, if I want to really break down Hamlet, I'm, I'm really studying this topic and I break down every character in the entire play, there might be 30 or 40 different characters. So that's a lot of different characters to go through. Um, also, something I'm seeing right now is that I've got a thought called Hamlet. That's Hamlet the play. I also have a thought called Hamlet. That's Hamlet the character. I want to do something that will differentiate these thoughts in my brain. So that is where the thought type comes into play. Now, Shelley had a great brain open that we can also share with you on um, the breakdown of the animal kingdom. So all of the families and the, the phylum and classes and categories that the animal kingdom falls into. And if you notice, each individual area was color coded. Sometimes they had unique icons and graphics. We call those thought types. It's a way of visually, visually identifying the sort of category that the thought fits into. So there's a couple of different ways to create thought types. We can do it with our thought tab down below. So down below, thought types, I can simply click the plus sign. The easiest way for me is always to simply right click on a thought. 
and I can assign an existing thought type. Now in our templates, we've got pre-built lists and groups of thought types for you. Here again, I started from scratch. So I'm going to create a new thought type called character. Now I can always go down to the thought types tab to activate a specific thought type to give it properties to visually identify them in the brain. So for my character thought type, I'm going to go to the thought tool tab where I can change its attributes. I'll give it a nice color. So let's say all of my characters will show up in this uh, blue. And I can also either right click on character or down below there's a little button on the thought tool tab where I can open up the brain's icon library. So let's quickly categorize these by people. And I don't know that there's necessarily an actor icon, but I can give this some kind of guy wearing a costume. So all of my characters, or in this case, key characters, let's rename this. This is a key character. So Hamlet is obviously a pivotal character in the play Hamlet. And so I have him standing out now. And, and notice that you know with all the other thoughts that I'm going to be bringing into, uh, into this area under Hamlet, Hamlet is always going to stand out. And anyone else, Ophelia is also a pivotal character as well. I can go in and reassign a thought type at any time. Also, and uh, I'm sure Shelly was going to show us this in her demo, we might have time to circle back because it's a much larger example. We can actually organize our groups of thoughts, large groups of thoughts. I'm gonna arrange this by, rather than just alphabetically, Let's arrange them by thought type. So my key characters. And Matt, I'm happy happy center. to show the U.S. president's example at any time. Oh, that is, that's a great example. Great. We'll definitely circle back to that because it's okay. a very impressive use of, of organizing large groups of thoughts by thought type. And here I've done it really quickly, and it's just nice because it makes these thoughts really stand out um, in a in a what will eventually be a much larger grouping. But also here on Hamlet. I would like to bring in my existing character study. So I've got a folder that I've got a shortcut to, and here I have an existing character study. Once again, I can drag and drop, as Shelly showed us, this Word document right into the brain. But in this case, I'm actually going to open it up, and I'm not interested in the entire document. This is maybe just a two-page document, but I just need uh, a couple of paragraphs from this document that are mostly important to me. This is all the information that I like to see or, or need to know for my upcoming test or uh, my role as Hamlet. So I'm going to go down here into the notes and paste. It's always important to point out that the, the notes in the brain, each individual thought has its own unique notes. Um, so we can paste content and quickly look up just the key pieces of information. And quite often I'll have both the document attached to the thought but a key paragraph or maybe a password or a phone number pasted right into the notes. And also we can grab images as well. Um, I believe I had here in my little directory, uh, the tragedy of Hamlet. This particular document has a nice little icon as well. I'm gonna copy this and just paste this on the thought for the play. So I right click and paste that in and notice that picks up the graphic and all of that additional information as well. And a few more components of this brain that I want to uh, share with you before I advance us through time to show you the final version that I have of this brain. Um, Hamlet is also related to, obviously it's been redone in movies over the years, many different movies. So there's Hamlet uh, with Kenneth Branagh. Uh, there's Hamlet with uh, Mel Gibson, there's quite a few different Hamlets, but this is a fun one and one that catches people off guard from time to time. The Lion King is simply an adaptation of Hamlet. The young prince, his father is killed by his own brother to take over the kingdom and the prince seeks revenge, etc., etc. It's the Lion King, it's also Hamlet. So that's sort of a fun, nice little relationship. And obviously, I'm going to categorize The Lion King under my existing thought for movies. So regardless in the future of how I happen to be thinking about, oh, there's that movie, The Lion King. It's a great way to introduce maybe uh, some young kids to the story of Hamlet. And so we'll watch the movie. So regardless of how I'm thinking about getting to this thought in my brain, 
I can go into Shakespeare and down through movies and find my content that way. I can go into Shakespeare plays, tragedy, Hamlet, and find that it's uh, find that piece of information as well. So that's really one of the great things about visualizing your information in the brain. The more connections you draw and and create, uh, the easier it is to find your information again in the future. And there's one other area that I want to build up in this example really quickly. I'm going to go into resources and I'm going to create an area for authors. So these are authors that may have influenced uh, Shakespeare or authors that or authors that were influenced by Shakespeare or just authors that I'm comparing to Shakespeare. So in one case, let's say I'm also doing a course study on the poetry of Edgar Allan Poe. Well, I just so happen to have the syllabus or the, the outline actually of uh, this particular course and what we'll be studying. And there are many, many different import options into the brain. That's another way that you can really build out uh, a very large brain very quickly is with our selection of different imports that could be done, whether it's coming from an Excel spreadsheet that's, that's properly formatted. In this case, it's a uh, tab delineated list. You can even import from properly formatted XML for the more techy, techies out there. But let's go ahead and just select this outline of the uh, of the course I'll be studying. And of course, this could be in Roman numerals or what have you, as long as it's tab delineated. It's going to work just fine. So I've copied that outline onto my computer clipboard. And here in the brain, I just right click and the brain already recognized that I have some type of outline on the clipboard. So I'm going to paste that into the brain. And here you can see we have the same structure that's in the Word document over to our left is now being visualized here in the brain. So we've got Edgar Allan Poe, the different categories. I can go down to his selected works, poetry, and even connect this poetry thought over to the poetry of Shakespeare. In this, this case, it would probably be called the sonnets. And connect sonnets up to Shakespeare's literature thought. So once again, we're visualizing and seeing those different relationships. And with that simple import, I probably brought in maybe uh, 30 to 50 new thoughts into this brain that I can continue on connecting and visualizing and relating to other pieces of information in the Shakespeare brain. So let's go ahead now and fast forward through time and I'm going to open my real Shakespeare brain. So this is a brain that I have worked on uh, probably over the years, I would say, and this brain is online and I will share it with everyone on the, uh, the call today. And this particular brain contains, number one, the complete works of Shakespeare. That's not hard to do. You can go online and find all of Shakespeare's uh, work available online. But once again, by putting it into the brain, we get greater context. Here, for example, is uh, the brain always opens on the last thought you happen to have visited. In this case, it was The Tempest. I saw The Tempest not too long ago at uh, the, the conclusion of the Summer Shakespeare uh, Festival in, in my neighborhood. And so I was on The Tempest thought, and I read through. You can see on the notes, I have a nice synopsis of every play connected to the actual thought itself. If I launch that attachment, it is the full script. So that's with every individual play, every sonnet, everything, the complete works of Shakespeare are all here. But what the brain does is not only do I get this nice character study of key characters down below, but also you can see that I connected The Tempest. There's some related movies, The Forbidden Planet and The Tempest in 2009. But I related this, or I linked this up to the timeline of Shakespeare. So this is more about Shakespeare's life, uh, where he was when he was uh, composing all of these different scripts, how old he was. And Shakespeare, not many people are aware uh, that The Tempest is his last piece. So uh, there's much more about The Tempest than just a tragedy or a journey that takes place out at sea. It's really Shakespeare's way of saying goodbye to the theatrical world, and it's his conclusion on his life work. And if you know that and understand it, you can read through uh, here sort of the last phase that, um, uh, that I've segmented Shakespeare's life into. 
um, if you have a better understanding of that he was now an old man and, and sort of retiring, that's his last final work, uh, definitely makes it a more poignant experience when you see the, the play actually in person. Um, and this particular area of the brain, really quickly I'll just share with you, is my resources area where I've flushed out, again, not only more about Shakespeare himself, but you can see I've got a complete dictionary that I'm sort of just keeping on my own every now and then when I uh, bump into a word, when I'm reading some Shakespeare, um, I'll simply go out here once I look it up and add it into my Shakespearean dictionary. So at any time I can say, uh, what is a gimel? A gimel means uh, to be made double or uh, made double with rings. So just interesting little words that he's made up over the years. And I've got further information about, well, this is sort of, sort of a fun one, an insult generator. So again, uh, Shakespearean insults that links over to, to games and, and so forth, just to have some fun with the topic as well. So this particular brain is, like I said, available to the entire world. I've synced this brain. I've created it here locally on my desktop. But any brain that you create, you can sync to the cloud. Now, there's different levels that you can upgrade your account to. Um, you can sync content with file attachments and so forth with the Brain Pro services. You can also upgrade your account to Team Brain, and Team Brain will allow you to actually share brains. So I can give Shelly editor access to this brain, or Patrick, or any other Shakespeare enthusiast that I know will add some really great content. I can share this brain with them as an editor, and we can contribute and collaborate all in the same brain. So to do that, I take my Shakespearean brain and simply click on the sync button. So I'll go ahead and say OK. And that will start syncing up to the brain cloud. It's syncing rather quickly. So I'm going to go online now. And here I am. I've actually already synced this, uh, this particular brain. So let me jump back to my account page. So you can get to or, or access your brain account by going to www.thebrain.com. And in the upper right-hand corner, just simply click on Login to log into your brain account. And these are all the online brains that I have access to. So here in Shakespeare, I can go into my settings. And once again, you can see I give, can give people, and I've given Shelley and Brigitte and Patrick reader access. I can remove access at any time. I can make Shelley an editor and save that content. But most importantly, when you sync a brain to the cloud, by default, it's going to be private. So it's encrypted, the data is protected, um, and it is password protected on webbrain.com. And if you are interested in knowing more about the great security we have for all of our brains, send a note into support at thebrain.com, and we can send you some further doc documentations on the AWS servers that we're storing on and, and, uh, and saving all the brains on. But regardless, by default, it's always going to be private, so only you have access to that particular brain. In this case, I've made this brain public. It's accessible to the entire world. I'll save those changes. And now what I can do is I can gather, let me open up the Shakespeare brain once again, and I can right click in the background when the brain is open, and I'll go into share, and I can share this entire brain by gra grabbing the brain URL. So there it is, this URL, will go out in a thank you email to everyone on the call today. So anyone, even without having the brain installed, can go to this URL, this web address, and start navigating through my Shakespeare brain to find and access all of the information that I've entered into this brain. Now, I'm la labeled as an editor, so let me just close this really quickly. Notice I've got further controls. Let's say we want to go into Shakespearean resources and create a new category for places to visit. So I can create that new thought right here from the web interface. I'm no longer on the desktop. I'm now on the web, so I can create my new thoughts, places to visit, and go into edit. And I could add information down below on how to get to Shakespeare's birthplace, how to get to the Globe, the Rose Theater, locations that are historic in Shakespeare's life, et cetera, can be down there in the notes. 
So we can continue on modifying and adding that additional information right from the web interface. And finally, and additionally, I can actually log in uh, to my phone and let's go ahead and pull up my Shakespearean brain. So I'm logging into, and here it's better to, uh, to actually have my camera on so I can see. There we are. So you can see here are all of my brains. I can click on Shakespeare. And there's the Shakespearean brain, if I can get it without the glare. There it is. There's my Shakespearean brain on my iOS device. So down below, I can access notes. So there's the notes I have for that particular thought. And uh, add further attachments, even add new links, new thoughts, and access other brains, all for my mobile devices. So we also have a device for Android users on the Google Play Store iOS device for iPad and iPhone, and of course, our web access online. So a lot of different ways and benefits to syncing your brain to the cloud to not only give access to other users, if you're a teacher and you want to create your syllabus or a case study uh, for your students, you can create that in the brain, sync that to the cloud, and not even type in, let me go back just for clarity, I can go back to my settings for this brain, I don't need to type in everyone's email. I can and send everyone an invitation email by email by typing it into uh, this add user here. I can simply leave this as unlisted or public, grab that URL and share that URL with whoever I want. Tweet it out um, or send it out in a series of emails, but, but share that URL so that others can find my brain and access it online. They won't modify that brain obviously unless you've upgraded to team brain and made them an editor so you've got a lot of different choices on how you can share the brain that you've created with others and Shelly with that I think we'll uh, if we can jump into any questions that we may have from today's demo all right sounds good yeah um, one of the questions that came in earlier from PH is can you show us how to use reports um, absolutely so here, let me jump back into my brain. Now, the reports are available from the desktop version. The reports do not show up online. Those are available when you're in reports. So here I am in this particular brain, and I'll refresh my reports. So first, when you come to the reports tab in the brain, I'll give this a little more real estate really quickly. When you come to the reports, and if you click on these blue arrows, um, you're going to refresh your report. This is an alphabetical listing of every thought in your brain. So I can click and go directly to that specific thought. And if I want, I can go down and select, all right, show me all thought types that are key characters. So now I'm filtering my report by a thought type or a thought tag that I've created. Or I can even go down to my a thought attachments, show me all internal file attachments or external file attachments. Now this particular brain is all made up mostly of the notes. There's not a whole lot of web attachments. Um, in Shelley's brain, that much larger brain, you'd see a breakdown of, you know, show me all thoughts with .doc files or PDFs, et cetera. So a lot of different ways that you can customize the reports. I can even say, show me all thoughts. Let's go back to all thoughts that have been activated within the past, we'll say the past week. So, or the past two weeks. So 25 thoughts in this three or 400 thought brain that have been activated. How many have been modified? How many have been created, et cetera? I haven't done a lot of new creating in this brain, but maybe modifying. So I can go in and say how many thoughts have been modified. Quite a few thoughts have recently been modified. So there's still a lot of uh, different scenarios that you can combine together in your report. And keep in mind, you can customize these. So you can create your own custom report and run that against your data again and again in the future. So much to be done with reports. We could spend a whole hour just talking about thought reports. Uh, but we'll also share with you some additional info. If you go on to uh, thebrain.com slash tutorials, there, are, there is a specific tutorial on using the reports. So. Um, uh, we'll be able to, to share that link with you directly. I'll look up that question and, and email that to you after the call today. 
All right, great. And I think we've covered most of the questions, Matt, but there was one big question that I think we're going to close the webinar on, okay. and that is a preview of the Brain 9. A lot of we did, we did do our um, beta uh, release to subscribers only, uh, and I don't know if Patrick has any more questions that he wants to bring, but I'm going to go pass it over to you now and uh, to give everyone who've been, who's been on the call um, saving the best for last in this case Great. because yeah. um, we'll go ahead and, and give you guys a quick pr uh, update of what's going on with our Brain 9 beta launch. Absolutely. So this just went out in yesterday's um, uh, newsletter. You can sign up for our newsletter at uh, www.thebrain.com. And yes, at the bottom of the page, we do have an announcement on the beta release of the Brain 9. So you can go to our homepage, click on this button, and it's going to tell you a lot more about all of the new features that are available, um, whether you qualify if you're currently subscribed to the Brain Pro Combo or a services program or Team Brain. Um, you can actually install the Brain 9 and import one of your brains and take a look and experience all of these great new features. So here it is. Um, I'm opening my Brain 9 right now. You can see these are some of the different brains that I have access to in the Brain 9. I'm seeing both local brains, so you can see the little picture of the computer there. That means it's local. When I see the radio signals, that means that I'm actually syncing that brain. I've got a local copy. That brain is also available online. And uh, let's go ahead and I've got my Shakespeare brain right here in the Brain 9. A couple of things to share with you, uh, just a few features. I'll just give you a taste and you can learn the rest from, uh, uh, from the Brain 9 page and by installing and playing around with it. But here are a few of the features that I like. Uh, let's take a look at, um, at one of the comedies of Shakespeare, Pericles, and notice that Pericles has these two little tag icons. I use tags sometimes to identify attributes of a thought, information about a thought. And in this case, I simply mouse over, my tags come into view, and you can see here, let's go to the uh, 1608 romance area. When I mouse over, I can see that I've seen that play, but I have not read this particular play. So just a little bit of in additional information, classification about information by those uh, tags that only appear on a need-to-see basis. And speaking of a need-to-see basis, the notes are much easier to edit. You can see when I click in the notes, um, I get this really nice uh, notes toolbar at the top, very sleek, fast, and a great way to edit and make beautiful notes. So I can take, uh, I'll just grab a sentence up here, and I can put my mouse in there and just change the formatting uh, really quickly and even I don't see any thoughts in here but here I can grab the word Shakespeare and I can actually link this to another thought in the brain so I can go up and select to insert a link to a thought and so that is going to link directly to the Shakespeare thought so if the note sees a word there's Hamlet I'll select Hamlet and I will link Hamlet up so the note itself, if it just briefly references one of the thoughts in your brain, it's going to take you there. And here we have another feature. I'm going to, everywhere I go, I'm going to see a new feature in the Brain 9. But this one is our document preview. So this is just a really simple TXT file, a text file. But notice it previews automatically for me over in the right-hand side of the, the screen. So I can preview PDFs, Word documents, Excel spreadsheets without ever leaving the application. Uh, and particularly web pages. Web pages will load up right in the window as well. I think Lion King is linked up to the IMDb for Lion King. So there you can see it's loading up right in the, uh, the content window. And finally, the last component, and this is a big one, I really, really like it, is our tabbed interface. Uh, so I can go back to my brain list, open a different brain in a different tab, so I can easily get back and forth between brains through the tabs, but I'll go ahead and open the same brain. So here I've got Shakespeare open, and I'll just go to a completely different area. Let's say I'm studying everything that Shakespeare wrote when he was working at the Globe. And once again, I don't have a lot of screen real estate right now, but uh, if I were to move this over onto my other monitor, um, I could put the brain on the Lion King, same brain on the Lion King in one brain window, and in the other, I'm in the Globe. 
same brain but different areas. So now I can start comparing and contrasting and looking at, you know, in a business application, the sales revenue and how sales are doing with my organization. I've mapped out the sales uh, charts and, and progress and so forth in one area of my brain, open the same brain open to research and development and start making comparisons between the two. So a lot that you can do with this great new tabbed interface as well. And I encourage you to go to the homepage, click on the Brain 9, at least just watch the video to see some of the great new features that are there. And if you qualify, download a copy and start playing with the beta of the Brain 9 yourself. And let us know what you think. We're happy to hear from you. Uh, we're getting a lot of great positive feedback and uh, we still have a ways to go. It is in beta right now, but please enjoy and let us know what you think. Thank you everyone for joining me today. It's always a great pleasure to share the brain uh, with, uh, with people in different environments, different types of settings and using the brain for different purposes. If you ever have additional questions, I know that we didn't get to all the questions today uh, in the question panel, but if you do have additional questions and you'd like to contact us, please do so at support at thebrain.com. We're happy to hear from you. And until then, once again, Thank you for, enjoy, uh, for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your week and enjoy your brain. Thanks, everyone. Bye.